good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. Uh, my name is Ho Chen. I'm the senior lecturer of livestock nutrition and grazing management at the Duke campus of Melbourne University. What we really want to share with you today is how do shelter belt affect soil health and past production? I'll first of all acknowledge our founder, the Goldman Broken CMA, through the state government funding and also the co funding provided by Melbourne University. Together with me today, we have Han Wei Hu, who is a senior lecturer in soil microbiology, heavily involved in this work. And we have PhD student Zhe Ling Li, and we have Nina Heno, also the students from Parkwell. And we also have Professor Tim Riggs as part of the Melbourne University team. And we also have collaborators from Goldman Broken CMA, Jenny Wilson, Karen Brinsprin, and we really appreciate Alex Graham, the local farmer, to provide us with the facility and the land to use for this research. A bit of background to start with, shelter brow provides vegetative barrier on farm to protect pasture and animal and potentially to protect the soil in very extreme climate environment. And we know that from literature that shelter brow may provide a beneficial effect to the crop yield, for example. However, such benefits should not be assumed and extrapolated across countries or regions in Australia. That is a very key message we learned from our literature review in the past. Further, looking at the literature review, we note that further research is required to assess how different types of shelter bell actually impact and interact with different forage and animal classes. It is important to note that a large proportion of the Australia literature fund was in the form of picnic report. In other words, it's more of an observation rather than a scientific research with replications. The effect of shelter bell on pasture growth are complex and the local research is needed. That is absolutely true. Therefore, we are conducting local research as a preliminary trial to understand some of the effect potentially would have from the shelter bell shelter valve to the soil, to the plant, and to the animal. Okay, now I'll pass on to my PhD student, Zhe Ling Li, to talk about the research trial, please. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Zhe Ling Li, a PhD student in University of Melbourne. And it, uh, from the beginnings, I just want to uh, tell us about the paddock history here. So the paddocks have been used for three years since uh, 2016 to 2018 for different crops like wheat, canola, and pasture. And then there will be another three year gaps and, and, and the ryegrass uh, again in 2021. 20, and so the palace is located near to Duki campus. So it's on the Duki Shopping Road. Uh, you can see it's not very far from the campus here. And thanks for uh, Alex to support the field for us to conduct the program. And also, uh, this is the design of the, our experiment here. The field has been uh, set with the two uh, side of the uh, shutter bell. Uh, one side is like uh, 16 meters high. Another side is uh, 11 meter high. So the, that's called field one and field two. And they will have the different rows that stand for different distance of the uh, away from the shelter belt. So 3H, 10H, 15H, and 20H, that's mean the three times, 10 times, 15 times, and 20 times of the three highs. And also we have the three replica uh, in each row. Um, and also you can see the weather station has been set as the 3H, 10H, and uh, sorry, uh, 3H, 10H, 15H, uh, the boundary of the uh, in between. So uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the weather station where we, we put to record the uh, maximum, uh, maximum uh, wind speed and also the temperature. Um, from the picture, we could see the, the left hand side here so is a, is a sh uh, shutter bell for 16 meter highs and another one is 11 meter highs. So here we just give you some like general information about the uh, path of we've been used. The soil types is a typical red soil, but some areas are brown soil. And two trials were conducted in this program. Uh, one is a spring, uh, spring trail, which is uh, from uh, September to October. 
And another one is a summer trail is from November to December. So spring temperature is ranging from uh, 13.6 to 21.1 Celsius degree, but the summer temperature is a little bit higher, which is uh, uh, ranging from 17.6 uh, to 29.3 Celsius degree. So they have also have different uh, wind speed. We can see here it's like for spring, uh, that's a one meter per second to 10.6 meter per second. But for summer, uh, it's a little bit uh, slow uh, wind speed. So that will be 1.0 meter per second to 7.4 meter per second. Okay, now let's go to the methodology of this experiment. So the soil sample was collected after the sheep complete the grazing of the pasture to the ideal height. So we sample the soil after the sheep graze up. So they, we sample the soil sample in the paddocks in Z sheep. So total 30 times connection in the rep, one replica. So in a one row, we will connect the 90, uh, uh, 90 connection of the soil. Uh, so the pasture height was measured uh, as a day zero. And also the weather station, as I mentioned in the graphs, is already set as a boundary of the 3H, 10H, and also 15H uh, distance. And also the weather data was being collected from the day three, day 10, day 15, day 16, 18, 21, 25, which is represented the whole week. Um, the pasture height also was being measured by using the uh, rising plant meter. And also uh, we cut the forage at the, uh, at the heading stage uh, and the oven dry and for the quality test at the day 39. So each trail will conduct like 39 days, similar to summer trail, but it's a little bit different with the beginning of the, the, the trail. So in summer, the sheep is not grease the pasture to the ideal heights. So that's the reason why we mow each replica around like four square meter. And also uh, we sample the soil in a, in a four square meter area in this ship with a smaller soil sample because we, uh, we still need to connect 30 uh, uh, connection in each samples. Uh, so in each replica. Uh, and the regrowth cage, which is around like one square meter was being installed and the pasture height was uh, measured by the resin plant meter as a day zero. Same as the uh, spring trails, the uh, rest of things. So weather station is set at the boundary of the 3H, 10H, and 15H. And also the weather data has been collected day three, 15, 16, 18, 21, and 25. Same with the, uh, the, the last spring trails, the uh, pasture heights was measured and cut at the hiding stage and oven dry for quality test at the day of 39. So that's the uh, regrowth cage that we put in the paddock. Uh, we could see it's in, put in the middle of the, uh, each replica. And also uh, regarding data analysis, the effect of the distance and the tree height on the pasture of the pasture regrowth yield were analyzed by using the uh, multiple way ANOVA by considering the distance, the tree height, and also their interaction. Uh, of course, that's in two seasons, which is a spring and summer. The general uh, linear regression was performed the relationship establishment. Uh, let's see the overall result in spring. So the overall result in spring, we could see the spring regrowth here uh, is a significant difference between the distance, the p-value here we could see, right? So the spring regrowth yield is different in distance and also in different treatment, which is a different tree height. And also their interaction is also significant difference. So here we will see the pattern later on with the graph. And also for the uh, crude protein content, they are also significant in the interaction, but it's not very significant in a distance and a tree height. But when they combine together, they will have a significant result here. Um, and for the spring uh, crude protein yield, we could see here, so they have a significant difference on distance and tree heights, but they are not significant in the interaction result. So that's the final result is not significant.
Okay, so uh, for the uh, metabolic energy content and also the yield, there is no significant we, 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 we've been seeing, but we, we can roughly see the MEE content, which is a metabolic energy content. They are going to have like a kind of like patterns that increase or decrease um, in, in, the, in a paddle. So the summer trails here, so we see, okay, so um, we hardly to see any significance in our overall result in the end, uh, with considering the distance and also the tree heights. So the regrowth yield here, uh, the result is not very significant. We will see the graph later on. Okay, so let's see the regrowth yield result as I mentioned before. So in the spring, it's very uh, obvious result that we can see the significant results that the regrowth yield is increasing with the distance and then drops again. So this pattern gives the indication that the shorter bell probably have the better protection in the area of the 10 high, 10 heights of times heights of the tree and also 15 heights of the tree. So that area so like more protection and also they will have a little bit decrease on the uh, 20 heights of the tree. So uh, that is a pattern of the spring regrowth yield. But for the summer regrowth yield, we, we could see the, um, the y-axis is different with the uh, spring regrowth yield, which is uh, much smaller and uh, they are not very significant among the each uh, distance. Okay, so uh, we are thinking about uh, why they will have this kind of like uh, result to show the difference on the on, on a different distance. So we analyze the analyze the nitrogen nitrogen uh, in a soil, and we find that they they are they are positively correlated with the uh, regrowth U and also the crude protein U. That's a two significant parameter that will be identified in spring. Okay, so then we find they have the regression here. Uh, find there are around 36 percentage um, like regrowth, regrowth yield can be expanded by the uh, soil nitrate nitrogen, which indicate that probably would be one important uh, indicator for the regrowth yield and also for the uh, crude protein yield during the two 39 days trails. And also, they, uh, we also see the uh, nitrogen distribution along the shelter bell with a, a different season. But for the spring, we could see here the average nitrogen, nitrogen uh, compared with the regrowth yield, because we already identified they are positively correlated each other. So that's the reason why like, we can see the similar pattern, but not very uh, correlated, because there are only certain percentage, 36 percentage has been explained by the nitrogen nitrogen. So, uh, yeah, we can see the similar patterns is uh, highest in uh, 15H and then drops again, similar with the yield. And compared to two, two different seasons, we can see here the total nitrogen in spring and total nitrogen in summer. So uh, in, a, in a spring, because they already have the uh, nitrogen that has an effect on the, on the final result because the plant can use the nitrogen nitrogen rather than ammonia nitrogen. So uh, the total nitrogen is just to give the indication as well to show the, uh, the yield pattern. Uh, for the total nitrogen in summer, uh, it's a little bit different. We can see the 3H is much higher. It's much higher than other uh, groups, which, indicate, which may indicate that stop camping at the shelter bell and give the, the shelter bell give the shape to the animal at this stage. So they will stay there longer and the ammonia and nitrogen will be higher. So we think, uh, think this way to go through the details. We find, yes, the ammonia and nitrogen, which is much higher at this area. And also we find the 20 H is also a little bit high. So which indicates, um, because when I go into paddock, I observe this kind of like animal behavior. After the sunset, the ships will go at that area. So we will find out the result why. Later on, okay. So yeah, so this is uh, this is the uh, average nitrate nitrogen in summer, and also the ammonia nitrogen. We separate these two, okay. Um, and also the relationship uh, between the soil moisture and the regrowth yield in two different seasons for twenty uh, for thirty nine days. 
here, so we could see, uh, okay, the soil moisture is uh, negative for it, but the result is not significant. Uh, so here, uh, uh, the, what we do here is that the soil moisture is not a good indicator to the yield because the soil moisture was sampled for one day, as I mentioned in the methodology, which is a one day sample, which cannot uh, show the uh, cumulative effect of the soil moisture on the yield, right? So it's not a very good indicator uh, regarding the soil moisture with the one sample. And also we have a look on the regression between the regrowth yield and also the crude protein yield. Here's we could see with the regrowth, most of the regrowth actually increase the protein content of the pasture. That's the, because that's the regrowth, right? <laughs> okay, the regrowth is uh, yield a positive with the uh, crude protein yield, which indicates the increase of the regrowth yield before the heading stage actually increased the crude protein production in the paddle. So the conclusion here so I wanna draw is the shutter bell have the better production for the pasture and also the animal uh, in 10 H and 15 H because sometimes they, they, they have a better protection for the pasture and uh, the animal will grease at their area and give the more nitrogen to the soil and the soil will grow, have the better regrowth of the pasture as well. So there's a kind of like positive feedback law for that specific area. And well, there is a, no difference we can identify in summer uh, pasture regrowth yield. Uh, shelter bell may have the better protection uh, and uh, pasture for advanced climate condition in spring and provide the shelter for animal in summer. That's what we identified that they stop camping at the 3H area, which is the tree can give the shade to the uh, animal, especially in hot weather. And also the soil nitrate may be the good and also the important uh, indicator for estimating the pasture regrowth. And bring the question back to the result here. Uh, as I mentioned, like the ammonia nitrate nitrogen in summer, it's a little bit higher here because as I mentioned, like the animal are happy to breathe at the area. So we go back to the overall result in summer. We could see here, even the result is not significant on the summer crude protein content, but we still identify the, the 11 meters and also the 20 meters is numerically high. So that's probably the reason why they attract the animal to graze then at that area and also have their urine and their feces at their area to natural the pasture there. So that's the reason why like, they didn't have the dramatically decrease in that area. Okay, so that's all the results we got from the, the general like regrowth uh, like aspect. And please uh, welcome to my uh, colleague, uh, Lina, and she will give more detail in, into the soil. Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Lina, and I'm going to explain this other part of the project that is called effect of shelter belts on the diversity and community composition of the pastures for microbiome. So, as we know, soil microbial communities are essential for the functioning of soil ecological processes. So composition, abundance, diversity of soil microbial communities and their capacity to respond to environmental challenges uh, can shift due to, <laughs> due to human and environmental disturbances. So it's been a matter of interest to explore how these soil communities can be naturally be protected from wind and environmental disruption. So one possible method to achieve this protection and gain at the same time environmental services is through the integration of shelter belts. So shelter belts research has shown that the establishment of shelter belts promotes stability and resilience in the ecosystems and also is a great alternative to protect against the wind and the soil erosion. So the aim of this project is 
focus on determining the effect of the sheltered belt on soil bacterial and fungal community and diversity in pasture soil, and also determining if the sheltered belts can be an alternative to avoid the loss of the topsoil and gain protection. So, as Selin mentioned, this is the diagram of the area, which is important to, to have clear. Um, as, as, as we said, uh, it's distributed in four rows with three replicates. So being the row number one or distance one, the closest to the shelf belt, and the row four, uh, the most uh, distant from the shelf belt. So the soil samples were taken to the lab uh, of soil ecology at the Parkville campus for two uses. One, the physical chemical analysis, and the second use was the molecular analysis. So for the molecular analysis, 0 0.25 grams of soil were taken for DNA extraction. Then the purity and quantity of that DNA was assessed, and then it was sent to external laboratory for sequencing including a characterization of the bacterial and fungal communities. So this analysis, this diversity profiling, um, was done through the amplification of the 16S RNA gene for bacteria and the internal transcribed spaces region for fungi. And data generated was visualized and analyzed through statistical tests to get an insight of this diversity and community composition of the samples at different distances from the shelter there. So for bacterial diversity, we use Shannon Index to visualize the species, species richness and diversity to these alpha diversity box plots. So here we can see in the in this axis, in the X axis, the rows one, two, three, and four, and in the Y axis, we can see the diversity index. Um, so, in this case, we cannot see any significant difference in the species richness or diversity between the rows, and also any differences between field one and field two. But you must be wondering why diversity is important. So, previous research suggests that microbial diversity plays a key role in participating and maintaining these soil key functions, such as litter decomposition, mineralization, and nutrient cycling. So it is believed that the more diversity in the soil community, the more resilient the environment is. Um, so for bacterial community composition, this term refers more to what, what phyla or what microorganisms are present and in which proportion. So these stock bars, let us visualize the phyla of bacteria present in each row and in which abundance. So in this case, dominant phyla are chloroplexy, planktomycetes, and actinobacteria. Um, they are dominant in field one and field two, and also they are in similar proportions in, in, the, in the two fields, field one and field two, um, in the two seasons as well. And similar studies have reported this phyla as a common phyla for this type of soils. Um, also, these studies argue that an increase or decrease in microorganisms belonging to certain phyla could be a sign of disturbance. So suggesting that the community composition can shift in response to environmental or external disruptions. So to check the level of similarity or dissimilarity between the community composition at different distances from the shelter belt, we use an NMDS plot, which is a two dimensions plot. So here, what we actually are going to explore is how different the communities are according to the dots. So the closer the dots are, the more similar they are. And the more separated the dots are, the more dissimilar the communities are. 
So this analysis was followed by a permanoa test um, to see the statistical differences. So in, we can see a strong significant difference in the row level, but and any differences by season in the field one and in the field two. So changes in the community composition in this case could be attributed to the influence of the shelter effect. However, the research also attributes changes in the community composition to external factors such as temperature, moisture, or physical chemical factors in soil. So, to determine the influence of physical chemical factors on bacterial community, we use a mantle test, which is a test that shows the correlation between two matrices. So pH and total carbon show a significant relation with the bacterial community. Um, but in this case, nitrogen, nitrate, ammonium, nitrogen, phosphorus, and moisture content, content did not show a strong correlation with the bacterial community. So to conclude for bacteria, we could say that shelter bell had an impact on bacterial community composition, but, in, but not in bacterial diversity. Um, also, that shelter bell has had an influence in pH and carbon that can indirectly modulate bacterial community composition. For fungal diversity, we use the same analysis for fungi applied to the fungal data. So here we could see that in the field one, which is the field with the highest shelter bell, we then see significant differences on richness and diversity composition between rows, but we could see uh, something different for this uh, field two, which is um, the uh, highest value here in the row three for, for diversity and the lowest here in the row four. So which is this also indicates that the diversity is different in these two fields. So in terms of fungal community composition, dominant phyla were Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. Um, in the spring, the population of Ascomycota here was more abundant than the rest of the phyla. But in summer, we can see a tendency of Basidiomycota community to increase gradually from row one to row four in the field one. But the opposite occurred in the field two here, which uh, where the population of Basidiomycota decreased gradually. So as I mentioned before, different microorganisms has, have different functions in the soil and changes in these proportions can alter soil functions. So um, for example, Ascomycota phyla has been associated to litter decomposition processes and Basidiomycota phyla is important in wood decaying processes. So, subsequent analysis of the community composition showed a strong statistical difference between fungal community at row level, but just in, this, in the field one, um, indicating these similarities between the communities at all distances from the highest shelter level. And in the field two, there were not significant differences for fungal community indicating that the communities were the same across all, all the distances from the shelter bed. So physical chemical elements that show a correlation with the fungal community were pH, total carbon, and moisture. Nitrogen presented large variations across the field, um, but did not show any significant correlation for bacteria, same as phosphorus. So we can conclude for fungi that fungal diversity was different in the lowest shelter belt, which is the field two, and fungal community composition shows significant differences in the highest shelter belt, field one, and shelter belt can exert an influence on pH and total carbon and moisture which can consequently have an effect on the fungal community composition. So 
I'm going to show some graphs of the behavior of the physicochemical elements across the field, also grouped by row. So here we can see the pH across the field. Uh, pH levels are slightly acidic and varied between 5.8 and 6.3. There was not much variation of pH levels between the two seasons. Um, and the pH has been reported as an influencer on shaping bacterial community. Um, total carbon, so carbon levels in the pill one and the pill two were higher in the row one, which is near the shelter belt. However, this tendency decreases gradually with the distance on both seasons. Um, some studies have reported a variation in bacteria community attributed to total carbon. Um, so nitrogen nitrate, uh, ni nitrogen levels are considerably higher in spring in both fields compared to summer nitrogen levels. Uh, despite nitrogen is considered a driver for microbial community in this study did not show any significance for the community composition. Ammonium nitrogen show fluctuation in values in the field one during spring uh, field two showed a more stable pattern in both seasons. Um, phosphorus in spring for field one uh, and field two, phosphorus levels are higher in proximity to the shelter belt. Um, in summer, the values were fluctuating. So authors have references that phosphorus levels have an effect on community structure, but in our study, phosphorus didn't have an impact on the communities. And moisture content was higher in spring in both fields, um, also higher in proximity to the shelter bed. However, it decreased across the field and the availability of this resource is considered a very important driver for soil microbial community. So that's um, our study and the, the results of, of all our, <laughs> our studies. Thank you. Thank you, Alina, for the excellent talk and together with Zeli. And now I would like to move the uh, topic a little bit more into the Trees on Farm project, which is uh, a project that started this year. Uh, Rochelle, are you ready to start? Yep. Yeah. Uh, um, will someone there get my slides or should I share my screen? Uh, no. Why? Can we allow you to? Right. You have control now. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. So um, this project uh, is um, just a, probably about a third of the way through. So I'll be discussing more about the objectives and methods and spend um, just a little bit of time on results so far. Uh, it's funded by Meat and Livestock Australia, no. DJPR, and the Tasmanian Climate Change Office. Um, so see how I can move these slides. Mm. Uh, not sure how to advance the slide. I can click that for you if you want. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Thanks. So uh, the three um, objectives, uh, firstly, is to develop a database that includes co-benefit and disadvantage um, information regarding planting trees on farm, and secondly, to estimate the value proposition of integrating trees into farming systems, and third, to develop a decision framework that will really assist farmers in accessing and incorporating information into their tree planting decisions and implementation. So we have a few ways to go about doing that, if you could advance the slide. You should have control. Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm not, oh, there it goes, yes, thanks. Um, so we have uh, 
a few different ways of addressing these different objectives. The in-depth interviews will um, contribute to all three objectives. The literature review is primarily um, populating the database, but also informing some assumptions for the case study modeling, which we're doing to uh, really quantify the, the benefits of integrating trees on farm. And then lastly, the focus groups will help us really refine the decision framework so that it's uh, applicable and easy to use and um, really actually helping farmers. So the case study farms that we have finalized to date are um, a mixed operation lamb and beef in East Gippsland, a large lamb operation in near Hamilton, and a beef operation in Northeast Victoria. We're also hoping to add a dairy to this, but uh, these are the ones that have been, um, that are already started. So a, a bit on results to date, the database currently has just under 100 citations um, incorporated. Uh, most of these are looking at productivity and carbon as the co-benefits and that's um, those were our priorities. So they did end up being reflected in the total um, amount of data included, but we do have a wide range of co-benefits in the, in the database currently. Um, the productivity is really almost 70% of that is looking at the impacts of, shelf, of um, trees on crops and pasture. Uh, the remainder is almost entirely on metrics related to sheep production, so wool, live weight, or mortality. And yeah, really highlights a, a lack of information available on the effect of trees on cattle operations, both dairy and beef. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, there is a, a fair bit on sheep mortality that, that we found, uh, reporting several different metrics and from different study types in different areas and quite a range of responses reported here. And that really reflects um, how variable this, this can be. You have different farming systems, different sites, uh, different planting designs, uh, different sheep genetics, and of course, different years the studies are performed and really um, highlighting how difficult it is to really nail down the impacts of the trees um, on their own. So um, on the Decision framework side, um, the core of our decision framework is going to be based on a decision matrix that's been popularized by Cam Nicholson. This is a very adaptable um, de decision tool that allows farmers to uh, make decisions based on their own situation, their own values, uh, and their goals. It's basically a process of thinking through a decision and being able to document it and being able to um, sort of make it a collaborative process. If there's a partnership, you can um, really show what it is that's um, driving your decisions and it can be revised over time. So this has been described in a few places. There's a climate webinar that Cam Nicholson did, um, also a short YouTube video, and um, there's a web tool that walks you through the steps of doing the decision matrix. And we have run through that process with some farmers. So um, that website has a library that if you search trees, you'll see examples of um, using this decision matrix for trees on farm decisions. Um, and this will be um, sort of the core of a larger decision framework that will um, really help farmers find and include information into their decision making process. So far, um, we, we have these examples that will help uh, farmers that are uh, more unfamiliar with the process think through the sorts of uh, cr the criteria that really will be driving their decisions. Um, the examples um, show how variable this can be between farmers and um, that will be able to help inform which factors a farmer might think would apply to their situation. 
And it also highlights uh, when particular information is needed. So if you're if a farmer decides on a critical factor that they need to know potential values for, um, then the database becomes quite complementary to that. Um, if they're interested in, for instance, the level of sequestration they could get, or um, uh, the values that have been reported for lamb survival, um, then the database can help um, uh, give an idea of what, what values could be um, expected. So uh, that's where we are today. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thanks.